Hi everyone, welcome uh, to this inclusive spaces session. Um, I'm going to start by saying that my cat has decided, as they always do, that now is the time to join in with us. So um, she may be turning up in shot, but I'm sure we can manage. Oh, there she is. Uh, so welcome to the Inclusive Spaces seminar series at the Bartlett Faculty of the Built Environment here at UCL. Today, you've joined the October edition of Inclusive Spaces. Um, I'm Joss Boys. I'm Director of the Learning Environment, Equality, Diversity and Inclusion Centre, uh, LEDIC at the Bartlett, and I'll be hosting today. This session will be recorded. Um, it'll be added to the faculty YouTube channel and to the Bartlett EDI website and forwarded to all you registered attendees. As Steve's already put in the chat, you're welcome to add a question or comment to the speakers at any point during this talk, but, uh, and by clicking on the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen. And you can also, as well as submit your own questions, you can uh, upvote others. So this inclusive spaces session is called Cripping Educational Spaces. And it's part of UCL's events connected to the International Day of Disabled People held every 3rd of December. Um, Cripping is still a word that makes many non-disabled people quite uncomfortable. But in this context, its aim, like the idea of queering spaces, is to start from understanding disability in all its variations as both a critical and creative generator for the built environment, not just a problem. So a means to rethink what counts as normal in university spaces. So we're asking, and we'd be really interested in your responses to this issue of, in the university setting, what are the unspoken norms that frame what constitutes competency or achievement? How do conceptual, social and material spaces value some kinds of body minds and not others? And how can both non-disabled people and academic institutions begin to take responsibility for their own unnoticed ableist attitudes and problematic teaching and learning practices? You would think that universities should be at the forefront of more equitable re practices related to disability, but in reality, as disability studies scholars and activists have repeatedly shown over many years, this is not the case. My own experience as a non-disabled person with a background in architecture is that there remains an underlying assumption that there are no or hardly any disabled people in architecture. In fact, through my work with the Disordinary Architecture Project, which brings disabled artists into built environment education and practice, I'm meeting disabled people within the discipline all the time. Yet, if you have a visible disability, it's still very hard to progress within our disciplines uh, with many barriers to achievement. And for people with invisible impairments, architecture is still seen as a very unsafe space to disclose to other students, tutors or professionals. And to me, that's a real indictment of current practices. It's something that really need, urgently needs change. And it's something that we should be angry about. So I'm particularly interested in unraveling both ableist privilege and exploring how non-disabled people such as myself can act in solidarity with disabled people in terms of these particular issues. So most immediately, that's about taking notice of, listening to and acting from the knowledge and experiences of disabled, uh, diverse disabled voices, scholarship, activism, and creativity. So I'm really pleased today. I feel completely honored to have these two guests here. Um, I'll introduce them briefly. Uh, and then the, organ the process of the, uh, the hour will be, Margaret will give a 30 minute presentation about her work and that will be followed by a 10 minute chat between Poppy and myself. And that will include responses to any Q&A from you, uh, the audience in the room, and then some final thoughts from the three of us so that we can end at 2 p.m. So uh, welcome and many, many thanks to Margaret Price for coming. Uh, it's very much earlier where she is. She's an associate professor and director of the Disability Studies program at her Ohio State University. She's currently working on a mixed methods investigation called the Disability Disabled Faculty Study, which combines survey and interview data to learn more about the experiences of disabled faculty in higher education. Her forthcoming book is called Crip Space Time, and will draw on findings from this study. 
uh, and it will be produced by Duke University Press. Price's first book, Mad at School, Rhetorics of Mental Disability and Academic Life, which was produced, uh, published by University of Michigan Press, uh, was an incredibly influential book for me. It's just a fantastic read. I recommend it to everybody. Poppy, welcome Poppy. Poppy Leveson is a third year undergraduate student studying architecture at Central St. Martin's UAL. As a blind person, she speaks about architecture's tendency to fixate on the visual rather than the experiential, as well as uh, working around the politics of inclusive design. I met her as one of the founder participants in our Architecture Beyond Sight intensive study course, which is an ongoing disability-led collaboration between the Bartlett and the Disordinary Architecture Project. It aims to be run annually. It's only stopped because of the pandemic. Uh, should be starting again. We should be able to run it in the spring or the summer next year. Um, and it's led by blind and visually impaired architect, maker and artist tutors. Poppy's also vice president of ASCSM, the school's architecture society and disability students right and political coordinator at Disabled Intersectional Voices in the Arts at UAL. So um, over to you, Margaret. Thank you so much. This is Margaret speaking. Uh, in the background of my Zoom frame, there's a large black dog's tail wagging. Uh, he's very excited to be included this morning. This is Otis. I'll just introduce him since he's so insistent on being part of it. Uh, so Otis is two years old and um, learning how to do some tasks for me. Uh, I have um, post-traumatic stress disorder and an autoimmune disease. So I have both mental and physical challenges and um, Otis is still in training, uh, off learning how to uh, help me uh, navigate the world with uh, all those things going on. Um, in the, oh, I'm also really uh, grateful to the organizers and to Joss and Poppy for having me here today. Um, it's just, these are, uh, this is my favorite part of my job is getting to have conversations about access and um, especially access as it operates in the built environment and in design, um, which is an interest that uh, Joss has really fostered for me over the years. Um, in the interest of time, I'm going to jump right into uh, my short presentation. Um, this presentation will be uh, interspersed with a couple of warm up questions that Joss and Poppy uh, will help me talk about, um, just so we don't have me droning on nonstop for uh, 20 minutes, and um, then we'll go to uh, the dialogue and Q&A portions. So I'm now going to share my screen. That means that I can't see very well what's going on in the chat. So uh, if anything is going on where someone's having an access issue uh, or otherwise just needs to get my attention, please just break in um, with an out loud comment like, hey, Margaret, hold up, wait, something's happening. Uh, I, I'd always rather have that happen than just <laughs> continue to speak while um, uh, something disastrous is happening uh, unbeknownst to me. Um, so I'm now sharing my screen uh, with my um, PowerPoint about to come up. And now, as I maximize my screen, this is the point at which uh, I will be very grateful to all of you if you could um, just speak out if there's anything that you'd like to um, address with regard to access. Um, as Joss mentioned, the title of what we're uh, presenting today is Cripping Educational Spaces. And the image on the slide is um, a picture I took several years ago at Vassar College. Um, it's a close up of the universal icon of accessibility, which is a person in a wheelchair um, on a green sign uh, and the word entrance and an arrow below the icon. I'll also mention that the icon is an updated version um, meant to show the wheelchair user as more dynamic and in motion. And this uh, updated icon was designed by Brian Glenny and Sarah Hendren. Uh, something that I like to say at the beginning of presentations is while I'm talking, please do whatever you would like to do that helps make this workshop more accessible for you. So that might mean moving around, leaving the space as needed, fidgeting, knitting. I've actually got my own knitting with me today. I've just started something. 
Uh, and as soon as we start chatting, I will probably start knitting. Um, you may observe me standing up and sitting down, um, pausing to get a breath, drinking my tea, interacting with my dog, things like that. So in the spirit of cripping access, right from the start, I want us all to consider what it might mean to make this space that we're sharing right now accessible for each one of us, not only in terms of really important things like, are the images described? Is the audio adequate? Um, but also in terms of things like, how is each person interacting with the space and what might that person need? Uh, in the interest of time, again, I'm going to just uh, skip right on to um, talking about the first aspect of access that I want to uh, focus on, which is um, access, uh, planning, and time. Um, time has been an extremely important facet of the research that I'm doing right now, which focuses on um, accessibility for workers in higher education. And um, this particular image, which was also on the cover slide, is one that really caught my attention at Vassar um, because uh, it shows me that a great deal of time and planning went into uh, this particular access move. But then in the interactive nature of the built environment, it may not have actually done what the designer intended. So as I mentioned, when describing the image, uh, this sign shows the updated uh, uh, international um, icon of access, which is the uh, more active looking um, schematic of the person in the wheelchair. Uh, there's also uh, the word entrance and an arrow underneath the icon. And um, the sign is quite obviously new. Uh, it looks as though someone really thought about this um, before putting it in. I'm now gonna show a couple more images that um, show where this sign is located in context. So the second image is a slightly more pulled back version. Uh, it's still a focus on the sign, but we can see that the sign seems to be uh, sticking up from the middle of a bush. Um, it's surrounded by shrubbery. Uh, so um, already we're getting a sense of the scale and the context of where this sign appears. And um, perhaps we might be thinking to ourselves, what's going on with the sign in the bush? Uh, so then the most pulled back version is the next image. Uh, this image shows uh, the sign in a much broader context. Uh, this is the building uh, pictured here is the library at Vassar College. Um, it's a very imposing neo-Gothic building. Um, it has turrets and uh, stained glass windows and lots and lots of fancy detailing. Um, it has a set of stone steps going up to the elegant wooden front door. Uh, there's a um, person wearing a backpack ascending the steps. Uh, I tried to make sure I got a person in there for scale. The person is really tiny in comparison to the building. And circled in white on the uh, right hand side of the photo is the uh, sign showing where the accessible entrance is. Now we can imagine that uh, when this sign went in, there were probably a lot of conversations about it. Uh, it's pretty obvious from the look of this building that it's one of those buildings in the United States that um, does not need to be made accessible in a contemporary sense. Uh, historic structures in the United States are, um, are uh, exempted from certain kinds of access moves. So as long as there is some way for people to get in this building, uh, who might be using wheelchairs or using canes or having fatigue, um, you know, in some way not able to navigate those stone steps or those big wooden doors. Um, as long as there's some way to get into this building, that meets the letter of the law. Uh, unfortunately, um, as we might infer from the placement of this sign, uh, someone who was approaching this library with the thought, wow, I can't wait to get into the library and start doing my work. Um, not only might they not actually perceive the sign off to the side there, um, even for a fully sighted person, that, that sign is pretty tucked away. Um, they certainly wouldn't feel very uh, encouraged about um, the, the nature of the access they were being offered. The sign is hard to find in the context of the building. Um, the sign is not brailled, 
for example. So the assumption is that uh, whoever is interacting with this sign will see it. Um, and the sign also is pretty telegraphic. Uh, it just says entrance with a bent arrow. So there's no indication about exactly where that accessible entrance is, how much time or effort it might take to get there, um, or uh, whether once you get around the proverbial back of the building, that entrance might be navigable at all. Uh, so this is a phenomenon that um, Canadian philosopher Tanya Tichkowski calls barely in. That is, the letter of the law, in this case, is being met, but um, the actual interactive nature of access being provided um, still presents a lot of barriers. And these barriers can sometimes be quite hard to explain um, to a non-disabled audience. Uh, I myself often find myself in conversations where the gist of what's being said is, well, there is a way in, so what's the problem? And uh, it can be very hard to explain the issue of frustration, taking extra time, taking extra effort, and perhaps above all, the uncertainty that's involved in trying to navigate these barely in spaces. So some questions that I want to propose, especially for designers and architects is, how might co-design have changed the decision-making around this sign's appearance and placement? That is, if people who um, were disabled in various ways might have been part of the design of this access move, would it be different? Um, but then also very importantly, and as you probably know, co-design can mean a lot of things. So we also need to think about questions like, when does co-design take place and what forms does it take? Uh, and I don't want to go on and on forever about uh, those questions, but I'm happy to take them up more in Q&A. Okay, so this is uh, the first brief discussion with Poppy and Joss. Um, and the question that I'd like to ask you, Poppy and Joss, is think of an event you've attended, a class, a meeting, an informal gathering that felt especially accessible for you, not accessible in general, but for you personally. What was the event and what specific features did it have that sparked that sense of inclusivity for you? Um, and I'll go ahead and drop that um, question in the chat as well as um, Poppy and Joss um, talk a little bit about that. You first, Poppy. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, I was thinking about this one and it's it's kind of sad, but it's it's hard to think of that many examples of times that have been like truly accessible, particularly if you think of like in an academic sense, I'm so used to compromising my access needs and stuff in, in spaces, particularly in, in those academic spaces. And I think the majority of the times that I have felt my access needs listened to, and they, I, they have been accessible spaces, have been when I've been with other disabled people. I know that at my university, it's been when I've been talking to other disabled students through our disabled students organization. And there is this understanding of time, there's this understanding that you might have had a bad day and so you don't have the energy to put your camera on, or that you, someone else needs to have their camera on and that's really helpful for them. And I found there's a, there's a particular kind of kindness and generosity about what you might need and it's just a given that what you say you need is believed when you're with other disabled people that I think is the truly accessible element. It's, it's being believed in whatever you say you need in that moment, whether that's like a traditional access requirement or whether that's something that just you feel like would really help you today. Yeah, and I do, I mean, I, it's really interesting that we already have comments in the Q&A uh, of people with impairment saying, you know, they, they can't think of a single example. Um, I mean, I really, I really like the work of Maya Mingus, who's talking, who talks a lot, as you know, you both know about the kind of notion of access in, intimacy, how access is actually about how we help each other out and support each other kind of on an ongoing process. And we may not get it right. Non-disabled people like myself may not get it right. But, you know, there's a kind of 
form of collect emergent collective care. And I think for me, the one example I have of that is actually when I was a single parent with a small child and teaching in an architecture school um, in a polytechnic. And uh, the group that I was in, where I was the tutor, um, I would take my daughter when she was a baby with me and she would just be passed around people, particularly actually young men um, from families, you know, non-British people. So she got passed around, but not in at all a way like, oh, it's your turn to take the baby. This is a problem. It was just part of the space. It was just part of the way that in a, in a, in a studio space, that's something you can do quite easily. You're gathered around together. And, and so that was... Um, that's kind of the closest I, it, it, it helped me understand what that notion of access intimacy might be, that it was a completely non-judgmental and just thoughtful and caring. And it was all, I was always asked, it wasn't like people would just take her off me. Um, and it made it possible for me to do my job. Thank you. Uh, this is Margaret speaking again. Um, my, my head is just teeming with examples of times that, um, I've been in spaces where that kind of automatic believing and give and take was part of uh, the water we swam in, so to speak. And then I've also been in spaces or situations where um, it almost seemed as though my access needs were uh, something to be um, examined. Like, why do you need that? How long will you need that? Um, can you give me the documentation to prove you need that? Uh, you know, well, what are the best practices around that so we can um, prepare ahead of time and never have to change again? Um, and uh, I, I should mention that my spouse is an architect uh, specializing in um, the intersection of sustainability and accessibility. Uh, I've just dropped your name uh, in the chat in case anyone wants to Google here. Um, and uh, it's really striking to me um, when I work with architects and designers, uh, how hard it is to navigate that tension between you have to have standards of practice and you also have to be responsive. Um, and that might be something else that we can talk about more during Q&A. Uh, I'm going to jump back to the rest of the uh, presentation and then um, we'll go to the dialogue portion. Oh, I'm in completely the wrong place. Oh, no, I'm not. OK, <laughs> uh, so um, in the next slide is a, a screenshot of um, the website where I um, capture information about the study I'm doing right now. It's just titled the Disabled Faculty Study. Uh, it's been going on for um, quite a few years now, so it's actually uh, evolved into something more like the Disabled Worker Study, um, since there are also staff and graduate students um, in the participant group. Uh, it was launched in 2012 uh, as a collaborative effort across um, several universities. And um, uh, again, I'm happy to talk more about the methodology and the incredibly slow <laughs> unfolding of uh, analysis and findings for this study. But um, just to quickly summarize some of the most important findings, uh, three of the key themes that have emerged from this study uh, in terms of how access actually unfolds in the spaces of higher education are space, time, and cost. Um, and by space, uh, the participants who talked about this theme were not only talking about the built features of the space, but also the ways the space is used and evolves over time. So for example, one participant um, who doesn't use stairs uh, talked about the fact that his building has an elevator, but it's shut off on the weekends. Um, and he actually goes into his office to work quite often on weekends uh, because he also has another disability that makes it difficult to focus. So he needs that very quiet time. Um, and he had to go through uh, an, an extraordinary sort of rigmarole with uh, his university to explain um, yes, I realize the building is accessible, but if you turn off the elevator on weekends, it's no longer accessible. Uh, and then um, he was also required to officially register as a person with a disability um, uh, in order to quote unquote prove 
that he actually did need to uh, use the elevator. Now, um, an interesting postscript to that particular story is that this particular faculty member, um, uh, going back to the issue of time and fatigue, um, he wasn't against registering as a person with a disability at his university, but he was against having to face the months long delay that that would have entailed. So he contacted the building manager for his office building and said, look, is there any way that you can do something about the fact that the elevator is shut off on weekends? And the building manager said, oh yeah, I can just stop. <laughs> I can just turn it back on. Um, there's no law that says I have to shut it off. It's just a, a general university recommendation about saving energy. So done and done. Um, and that I think is a great example, not only of how burdensome the conventional path toward access can be when we think of it as an individual problem that must be adjudicated individually, but also sometimes how radically we can change environments when we simply believe what someone says, uh, instead of getting into, but why, but does that match with best practice? But what about this? Um, just believe what someone says and see what happens. Uh, in terms of time, I talked about this a bit uh, when I um, looked at the, the access sign outside the library, um, but it's really critical to recognize that um, access that requires a lot of time and effort is not the same as access that is um, more seamless. Excuse me, that's my, uh, that's my reminder to myself that I'm wrapping up in four minutes. Uh, so something that the participants in this study talked about a lot were waiting, uncertainty, planning ahead. Uh, these were all sub themes that were coded within the larger theme of time. And finally, uh, cost emerged in all kinds of ways over the course of this study. Um, uh, and cost wasn't only the uh, ever fresh topic of budgets and uh, what kind of access we can afford, but also issues like emotional cost, effort expended, repetitious effort as we have to advocate in the exact same way for our access needs, often to the exact same people, and frustration. Um, a lot of uh, disabled workers in higher education and students as well simply drop out. Um, and until recently, we haven't had very good numbers on that, but um, the research on that is getting significantly better. Uh, I've put the URL for uh, the kind of clearinghouse for this study on the slide. Um, it's Margaret Price, all one word, dot wordpress.com forward slash disabled hyphen faculty hyphen study. Uh, now, the next thing I want to talk about, uh, and I'm going to kind of jump ahead to the end of uh, this talky part so we have more time for dialogue. Uh, the last thing I want to talk about is um, what kinds of activities could we do to um, foster a more nuanced sense of access. And this is especially important when you don't have a lot of disabled participants just ready and available to consult with you. Um, so uh, two things that I've tried are accessibility audit audits um, in my classes and um, experiments with audio description. And I'm now gonna just quickly show some examples of this instead of talking about each one at length. So uh, I have borrowed the phrase mapping access from the scholar Amy Hamrai, A-I-M-I-H-A-M-R-A-I-E. Um, Amy is uh, one of the leaders of the Critical Design Lab at Vanderbilt University. And um, they have developed um, a way of doing accessibility audits that is dialogic, critical, and interactive. Um, so uh, I often ask the students in my classes to try out accessibility audits for various reasons. And when they do these audits, we don't just do things like measure doorways or um, note if sidewalks are broken. We do that too, because those physical and measurable features are a very important part of access. But we also note things like, is this alternative pathway long? Is it well marked? Um, will the person trying to take the alternative pathway have a sense of where they're going? Or is it just kind of like, go this way and you might have access at some point? Um, are there subtle access barriers, like a ramp that's actually too steep or has no handrails? 
Um, and uh, I really encourage everyone to check out the wonderful uh, access guide that um, one of my classes made for the 2020 uh, Society for Disability Studies Conference. Um, the uh, access guide is available from the website of the Transformative Access Project. This is a project I'm involved in at Ohio State. And the URL for this guide is u.osu.edu forward slash transformative access, all one word. And from there, you can go to the tab that says mapping access. Uh, I've also asked students to create video presentations um, about uh, the spaces that they inhabit and ways that they do and don't find them accessible. This is another way that I really like to work with non-disabled students about um, uh, what access really means, not just if you have a documented disability, but if you're a human moving through the world. Uh, so the screenshot um, on the slide right now is from a student presentation um, uh, in which a student was looking at and analyzing classrooms that he inhabits uh, to think about how they are more and less accessible for people with panic disorder. Um, now, in this case, the student does have a sort of official disability, um, but other presentations that students have designed for this assignment include questions like the volume of commercials when you're watching television, or um, whether they have remote access to their classes, regardless of disability status. Uh, so this kind of activity is kind of twofold. I ask students to think about access critically, but I also ask them to learn basic access skills like captioning and describing. Let's see, that's time. So I'm actually gonna go ahead and um, pop out of the PowerPoint now. Uh, I'm going to share these slides uh, with everyone who's attended. Um, I'll do that via Steve. Um, and uh, that way people can look at the rest of the information. Everything is linked by URL that's spelled out on the slide uh, so that um, you can visit the sites and look at them um, in more detail. But I really think it's more important to talk to each other. That's where the really good stuff happens. Um, so I'm going to wrap up my remarks here and pass it back to Joss. Thank you. Sorry, delay in finding the mute button as usual, even now, years into doing this. Uh, thank you so much, Margaret. I really, that was just so helpful. And there's been lots of questions in the Q&A, which we'll come back to, but which really completely support this idea that um, everything is kind of so bureau, it's so much around bureaucracy that takes a lot of time. So there's a lot of comments from people who've uh, with disabilities who've been experiencing exactly those sorts of um, frustrating, time-consuming and really unnecessary difficulties. Uh, but before we get to that, I would just love to um, have a bit of a conversation with Poppy about her experiences um, and also about, as with Margaret, thinking about some of the things that do need to change and how we might make that happen. So, um, Poppy, do you mind just talking a little bit about your experiences of being a blind student studying architecture? Yeah, that's fine. Um, so I'll just start by kind of explaining my disability experience very quickly. I um, have been visually impaired since I was born um, until this year, and then I lost a significant amount of sight. And so I'm now registered as blind. So when I started my degree, I was visually impaired and now I'm registered as blind. So I've kind of had a similar experience all the way through my degree, um, but obviously things have become a bit more tricky now because I found that the way that the university dealt with it was kind of like, you can just about manage with these things. And the whole way through, I'd be saying, just about managing isn't good enough. And also, like as a lot of disabled people know your condition can change even if it's not supposed to change and it can change from day to day whether that's like a big change or just like you're particularly tired at one point and so things that you could do you can't do today um and so i think it's kind of in some ways proved this point when i then lost more sight that was this attitude of just try and do what a sighted student does 
but struggle to do it doesn't work. We need to kind of take a more radical approach when it comes to disability, which is actually looking at what works for you, for what your needs are. And I think that's something that was such a massive takeaway from the Architecture Beyond Sight course for me was I was surrounded by other visually impaired and blind people. And at no point did we go, I wanna do this thing like a sighted person. We all started from the point of being blind and being visually impaired and embracing that as the starting point. And it was a time for me where I'd, I'd gone to a mainstream school. I'd always been surrounded by sighted people. I'd never even spent that much time with other visually impaired and blind people. So for me, it was, it was such a sort of awakening of that just trying and struggling to be what is normal quote unquote normal is is not the right way of being it's we should be starting and we should be sort of embracing our differences um and i think um to give the university some credit most of my tutors really embrace my attitude towards it and are completely supportive of that it's when you come up against the very fixed like mark schemes and the REBA guidelines of what you have to do to be an architect, that you come up against the biggest barriers where you can try and be radical as much as you like, but as soon as there's bureaucracy in place, then that's when the challenges start. Um, and then I think the other thing that's worth mentioning is that like Margaret's been saying, so much of my time as a student is just spent sorting out my access needs. Like, this year, I say at times I was spending a day a week trying to sort out my access needs and not doing my degree. <laughs> and anyone that's done architecture knows that it's it's really full on. You need to be able to give your whole life to it in the current situation, which I don't necessarily agree with, but that's the way we that's the world we're in at the moment. And so if you're having to spend a fifth of your time working on how you're actually going to do the work and not working it just automatically puts you at a disadvantage so i think yeah and it's it comes with like self-advocacy and it's the sort of emotional load as well of having to sort of come out as disabled to everyone you meet and tell them and not have them believe you immediately or people say oh you're not really blind even if they don't mean it, it, even if they don't mean it in a malicious way, there's just so much like wading through other people's attitudes towards disability that again, take time and energy to get through, which as an architecture student, you just don't have. <laughs> yeah, I do. And I mean, um, we talked before a little bit, I don't know if you want to say a little bit more about, you know, that there's, in a way, it's also a critique of that kind of quite toxic kind of way yeah. of being taught, of the way that architecture is taught and the idea that it should take up every hour of your day so that it's problematic mm. like for everyone. But obviously, yeah. if you're also negotiating all these extra burdens, unnecessary burdens that are put on you as a disabled person, then it's kind of really pushing you back, whether, you know, it's kind of crazy. It's crazy. Mm. Yeah, I think the sort of culture of overwork is inherently ableist. Um, and that's something that a lot of people are finding during the pandemic that weren't disabled or aren't disabled and they're going, yeah, this is really toxic. But it's something that disabled people have been saying for years. And um, because of my increased sight loss, I've decided to take my third year over two years. So I'll do half this year and half next year. And what I found quite upsetting really was that when I was talking to my fellow students, they were all going, oh, I'm so jealous. I wish I didn't have the stress. I wish I had the time to enjoy the work that I'm doing and actually be creative and all of these different things and have work-life balance and be able to sleep. <laughs> and then you realize like how bad the problem is that people are jealous of me for needing an access requirement that means I can do the course because it's going to make my experience of the course so much better. Yeah, no, it's, it's, uh, and I know that you've been involved, I think, a bit in the Future Architecture Front and some other groups that have also been thinking about mm. that. 
Um, and I do, I, I'm almost, it's sort of very typical, isn't it? Here I am, a non-disabled person. I'm going to ask you, uh, a disabled person, about what you think should change. You know, like, <laughs> as if it's all your responsibility and nothing to do with yeah. uh, uh, those in the audience who are non-disabled actually taking some responsibility for this and, and um, not just kind of leaving it to disabled people to sort out. But in terms of your course, um, there's a question in the chat, actually, about... Um, the design studio, but I wondered, you know, just anything really that you wanted to say about um, uh, how well, architecture courses could change. Um, I think I'm, like one of the things that I really think is important that's not directly to do with architecture education, but it's that I didn't think I'd get onto a degree ever. At the, when I was doing my A levels, I ended up getting an A star, an A, and an E because one of my courses just didn't make anything accessible. They gave me a textbook I couldn't read and they sent me PowerPoints that they had worked examples. And that was it, for my maths A level. And I thought, I'm never gonna get into university. I'm never gonna be able to do the degree I want. And we really need to start thinking about how architecture schools sort of show off, like, oh, you need three A stars to get in here, or you need this. Um, and that in itself is blocking people that would be really good from getting in and from being able to have those opportunities. And particularly when we're talking about disability, attainment is much lower through the education system that we have. And so there needs to be allowances made in order to get disabled people into the industry in the first place. And then within the industry, I think one thing that will be really helpful <laughs> is having more people because I'm finding that there's a lot of these issues that I'm one of the first people having to deal with. I'm one of the only people I know that's going, oh, Adobe doesn't have any accessibility features. Or how do I do CAD if I can't use the graphics that they have? So we need, we need people to like <laughs> be campaigning within it, but then we also need the non-disabled people around us to be supporting us through that. Like I've been asking my university to back me up when I'm talking to Adobe because the weight of a university, the second best arts university in the world has so much more weight than just one undergrad student. And we need this collective force and action and anger in order to be able to actually make any substantial change. And that goes through everything from software to the entry requirements like I've said to the like how we run courses yeah I do I'm um, I'm aware that time is going on but I would like to ask you one more question because it does <laughs> also relate to a question in the chat so I know we talked before a little bit about you know the canon and you know the curriculum and how disabled mm -hmm. people just don't exist in that uh, yeah. But there's also a question in the chat from Jordan about um, what have you found are the main boundaries in the design studio in terms of both culture and practice? So are the particular kind of key things in the design studio that you think could be changed, dealt with differently? Yeah, I think I personally find like the concept of this is slightly different from a studio, but but like the concept of a crit, I'll, I'll be there standing there presenting work that when it's all pinned up on a wall, I can't see myself and I'm presenting it to people. And then I sit there and I look at everyone else's presentations that I can't see. And I think that's like such a big thing. There's so much pressure on the visual and that like, even when I am in a space saying this constantly, talking to people saying, I can't see this, I can't do that, or, and like, oh, maybe you could have a written piece or talk about it in a particular way that even when you have disabled people in the room, it's still nothing's changing access wise because of the way architecture is so set in its ways of how things have been done. Um, yeah, and the same with whenever I'm talking to a tutor, they always want to like sketch things down because they think in such a visual way. And so it's like trying to like claw the words out of them to <laughs> describe things. So I think like um, 
Margaret was saying about like just getting more people talking about access and like you were saying about getting students to do just audio description and things these are skills that architects would benefit from having that would also make things a lot more accessible yeah no and I, I mean Margaret gave some really great examples of you know some of the things that she does to kind of get into this area in a, in a much richer way than it's often dealt with and I think that the for me being introduced to kind of audio description which is one of the first projects this ordinary did which was working with um, architecture students as audio describers to blind and partially sighted people uh, doing an architectural tour but what they were learning was how to describe things really really beautifully and poetically and what they were also learning was how blind and visually impaired people already know lots and lots about space that is complementary to additional to different from a kind of visual way of engaging with the built environment so it was like a really powerful foundation project and and we've certainly architecture beyond sight one of the things it was thinking about is could you design a building entirely through audio description and how would it be different and i i do think mm. i think the power and the potential of audio description in in its richest most poet, poetic way is is fantastic and it's just completely um missing from architecture and mm. to think that yeah that your tutors could actually do a project where everybody has to do it as an audio description and not drawn would just be really it'd be really interesting to see how the projects change what changed about them I think that's yeah. really Can nice. I jump in on this actually? Of course, please do. I, we need, we're kind of winding up. I'm oh, trying well, to answer the questions, but do, yes, yeah. winding up well, includes asking you to jump in. <laughs> this is a very quick thing about audio description or image description, which I think is especially interesting for designers and architects because, Poppy, as you say, often designers and architects are people who think visually. Um, and explain things visually and um, that act of translation can seem very daunting at first. Uh, so one thing I always try to teach my students is that um, image description is actually something they do all the time. Uh, or they hear it all the time, for example, if they listen to podcasts um, routinely if there's an image or an outfit or just an event that the hosts need to describe they'll quickly describe it. Um, and uh, anytime we don't have visual access in a way that we think of as quote unquote normal, we describe things to each other. Uh, but when we think of it as something we're doing quote unquote for disabled people, it can seem difficult and esoteric. Um, so I definitely encourage people uh, once the PowerPoint is shared, actually I'll, I'll put the link in the chat too, to look at the video that I made with students about um, image description. Um, but I also want to share a very quick thing that I ask students to do as they're learning to do this. One of the very first things I ask students to do every semester is um, put an image in their avatar on our course management system. It doesn't have to be an image of their face. It can be an image of anything. And as one of their first assignments, I just say, please make sure your avatar has some image uh, and write a one sentence description of the image uh, so your classmates know what it is. Um, and I don't say this is a disability exercise or this is us learning image description. Um, I just say write one sentence describing it. Uh, and I find that can be a nice, uh, easy on ramp to the concept that um, everyone can and should describe. Uh, there are professional practices to know about. I mean, there is a rhetoric to it. There's a politics and it's useful to know those things. Um, but you don't have to assume that you're fantastic at it before you start doing it. Thank you. No, I think that's really, that's brilliant. And I, it, we've got just a few more minutes left. So um, I hope that nobody feels that I've missed them out from the Q&A. There's been quite a lot of comments. There's been some stuff about UCL East, which I don't think it's our role to talk about. Um, and um, I, what I really would like to do, and I hope everybody's happy with this, is just conclude uh, by asking our two speakers to think of and tell us one or two things they'd recommend that people should do, particularly non-disabled people, university leaders, non-disabled students, teachers and practitioners. What, what one additional thing, we've been giving some suggestions, but what one additional thing, Margaret, do you think, what would be a great thing for people to do? This is something that I often suggest when I'm doing 
workshops with people at schools, um, I think it's very fair for people to say to me, I, I need some solutions, like I need some best practices, uh, especially because my work is quite theoretical and it can be hard to think of somewhere to put your feet, so to speak. So one thought experiment that I offer people is go through the next week doing the following thing. Every single time someone tells you they need something, believe them. That's the whole thing. That's it. That's the whole exercise. The person might be disabled. They might be non-disabled. You might be looking at a building standard. You might be talking to your toddler. Uh, you might be uh, thinking about whether you'll take the elevator or the stairs. You might be thinking about whether your student is going to get an extension. Just try as a thought experiment, believing every single thing someone tells you about what they need. Uh, now, that doesn't mean you have to do it for them. If it's your toddler saying, I need to hit you with this broom, you don't have to act on it. But um, it can be extraordinarily transformative to begin from the place of, instead of saying, well, why do you need that? Or, well, what is my best practices checklist saying about it? Just believe what someone tells you. That's it. It's really good. And Poppy, what about you? One, one thing that you'd like people to non-disabled people in particular to to do i think this is very similar to margaret's it's kind of like think about what the impact would be if you don't do something you know if you if you build a, if you design a building and you haven't made it accessible like that says to me that you don't care or you haven't thought about it and i think that's something that's so often left out of the discussion is that it's not just oh, that's annoying, I can't get into that building. It's the emotional impact of that happening every day, everywhere you go, and that you are be, you are not valuable, you're not important, they haven't thought about you. All of these things, it's, it's not just what it is, it's the impact that it has. And I think if you think about that, be it from someone's access needs in a classroom or the access of a building, you suddenly have this sort of generosity to you. You remember why that person might need a bit more time to do something. You you just are a lot kinder about things. It's a much more generous approach to access. Instead of just going, this is what the building regs say, you kind of go, well, what impact will that have if I go above the building regs? Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you both. Um, I just want to end by mentioning a small project that we've been planning to do with the Disordinary Architecture uh, group for some time, which is to amplify the voice of disabled people within the built environment, education and practice. So we thought we'd be produce some sort of pamphlet type publication that both describes the experiences of barriers to equal participation and offers examples of how to start from non-conforming ways of being in the world as a way of offering up both critical and creative perspectives on the limitations of our current architectural, educational and professional practices. So this is a call out to anybody here or that you might want to pass on to others who would be willing to answer some brief questions. This will be done anonymously. Um, that we can then collate and share in a, in a uh, well-produced form um, as widely as possible, because those things are just, um, I mean, I know these things are said again and again, but they don't somehow penetrate through to the non-disabled world. So if you're interested in being involved, then please email disordinaryarchitecture at gmail.com. Uh, with the title non-conforming in architecture in the title bar. That would be really great. Uh, or you can always email me on my UCL um, email if you want to. Thank you so much to Margaret and Poppy. Thank you to everybody for joining us today. Um, uh, I've really enjoyed it. I hope you have too. Um, Inclusive Spaces is back on January the 19th with a discussion on decentralizing the solar economy. So you can sign up for details of that in the chat and we hope to see you then. Um, and I would just like I, to thank um, our two speakers and everybody who's commented uh, and to say goodbye. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me.